welcome back to part two. Let's take a look at freshwater use, or in our cases, overuse. So available freshwater resources, um, I guess I could ask you to predict this. Which areas of the world have the least amount of freshwater resources? The desert, of course, right? So we should be familiar with North Africa and Middle East. Those are the most, um, yeah, the most dry areas. And in the U.S. here, we use the most water per capita of any country. You can see us down here on the very bottom, about double what is the global average of water use. What is the biggest use of water in developed countries like the U.S.? This is the multiple, oh, that should be multiple choice. So pick one of those choices and pause now. Okay, did you pick... D, electric power plants for coal plant, like for cooling coal plants, that is the correct answer. Um, so when we study power, elect I'm sorry, when we study energy, we will learn that most of the energy that we produce, like mm, at least 85% or so, is produced from burning fossil fuels in electric power plants, like coal, burning natural gas, those are the two main things. And so you need to have cooling water for that process to occur. Here's a little diagram that shows going from 1960 to um, about 2000 or 1995. Blue is thermoelectric water use, and that is highest. Brown is irrigation, no surprise, that's second highest. And then you get um, industrial, so used for manufacturing and things like that. And then you get public supply, which is people using it to do everything they do every day, bathe, cook, etc. And then um, the last thing would be rural, so I guess that's for people who are um, on well systems as opposed to public water supply, like myself. Okay, how do we use water? Basically, consumptive use means the water is removed from the aquifer or the surface body and not directly returned. So these are the facts and figures on that. And cons non-consumptive use means removal of water is only temporary. So when we do power plant cooling, that's non-consumptive. And um, hy hydroelectric would be another example for that where um, the water is just passing through a dam. Here's the bottom line, star, star. 80% of all water withdrawal is for agricultural irrigation and cooling of electric power plants. So these are obvious targets for water conservation. And where does the water for these Kansas crop fields come from? This is a satellite image. Maybe if you've ever flown over the um, Great Plains, you've looked down and seen something like this. The answer, of course, is the ground. And uh, there is a huge aquifer, in fact, one of the biggest in the world, which is under the Great Plains. you got Nebraska here, Kansas, Oklahoma, down into Texas. Uh, gigantic. It is underneath the, um, yes, here. It provides agriculture productive here. It is called the breadbasket of America, right? This is where we grow so much of our grain, especially. And it's being depleted unsustainably for irrigation use. How do we know it's being depleted? Because... Um, when we look at charts over time, we can see that comparing 1980 to 1995, areas in orange represent drops of up to 40 feet in only 15 years. So the water table under the ground has decreased by that much. And um, we see some darker areas which are, um, which are um, almost pretty much gone, I think is what it's saying there. And the yellow would be um, less of a decline. And for a lot of it, we don't see any significant, but this is big. We have areas that are really dropping. And um, this is important because one in three humans rely on groundwater for drinking, including myself. 99% of the rural U.S. relies on groundwater for drinking. And um, extraction from aquifers is increasing, especially in developing nations whose agriculture intensified with the Green Revolution. Uh, when we take a look at um, groundwater depletion, we can see it being a big problem in the Middle East as they're trying to do irrigation for a large growing population. And um, let's see here, we'll take a look at India in just a moment with that. So when we talk about gr groundwater depletion, it's a bigger threat than surface water depletion because aquifers recharge very slowly. The water goes through the, that porous rock at a really slow rate. And we are making more withdrawals and deposits, and the balance is shrinking. This is referred to as water mining or overdrafting. And in some areas, it is falling by 1 to 3 meters, 3 to 10 feet per year. And um, another fact about the Ogallala Aquifer, it has lost over time the equivalent of the yearly flow of 18 Colorado rivers. And from our, um, from our study of water in, this, in our textbook, 
we know that along the Colorado River, there's a lot of water flowing, and a lot of it's being diverted along the way for irrigation. So when we have overdraft or overextraction, we get something happening called subsidence. It's when the ground actually lowers because you're taking the water out underneath it. And it can happen when aquifers become dry, forcing the aquifer rocks to bear more weight and compact or crush. So look at this guy. Where he's standing, he's saying that in the year 1925, the ground used to be way up here. And when I say the ground, I guess what I really mean is elevation above sea level used to be here. But the ground has been dropping in relation to sea level that much. That's pretty huge. And um, let's see here. We can uh, take a look at sinkholes, which are an extreme example of subsidence that can occur when water tables drop due to extraction outpacing recharge. Recently, a person in Florida died when his bedroom fell into the ground. No joke. Going back to India here. Uh, this is an area of India called Gujarat, and we can see that from 1983, so 84, 83, that um, we, the groundwater is, has dropped. And what, what we're looking at here is areas where the groundwater has reached a minimum, areas uh, locally where it's reached where it's at uh, its maximum. This is the average of the two. In other words, they pick several locations in the area and they measure the groundwater. And this is the lowest, this is the highest, this is the average. Clearly, it is dropping. And when it drops, we can sometimes be faced with the problem of saltwater intrusion. This would be for areas that are along the coast, where the water table actually drops below sea level. So sea level is actually coming in to your aquifer, and now you're pumping seawater, and that's no good because seawater is, is a pretty much useless for anything. You can't use it for drinking. You can't use it for irrigation. The only way you can do really, the only thing you can do at that point is drill new wall, well or desalinate the water, which are both very expensive. In Santa Barbara, we have a pretty awesome system. We can have a variety of sources for our groundwater, I mean, our fresh water. Lake Kachuma was built in the 60s, and there's a tunnel that goes through right, right through the ocean. I would love to see that someday. And then that water goes to our treatment plant, of course, where they chlorinate it, make sure it's safe for drinking. And then it goes to us. Um, well, it sits in a reservoir for a while and eventually goes into you know, all your homes and businesses. We also do get water from wells around town. We also can get state water coming in with the state water pipeline. And um, we also do water reclamation, as we saw at El Estero water treatment plant. So um, that means less fresh water that we have to use from the treatment plant. And um, yeah, so we're in good shape for that. But of course, Kachuma is only at about, uh, last I checked, I think it was 40% capacity. And, um, and our wells, our water t table is no doubt lower than it was a year ago or two years ago before we were, um, you know, before our last big rain season, which happened about three years ago. So there's no certainty when it comes to water. What are the solutions to overusing water? You could install low flow faucets and appliances. You could use automatic dishwashers, which studies have shown use, can use less water than doing them by hand, depending on your technique. You can replace your lawns with native vegetation, which um, we call xeriscaping, and we'll see that in a moment. And you can keep your lawns, um, if you do keep your lawns, water them at night to avoid evaporation or to minimize evaporation, and recycle gray wastewater. Let's take a look at those concepts. Xeriscape, uh, xeri means dry, so you're landscaping with drought tolerant native vegetation, but still very attractive and more appropriate to the region where we don't get rain throughout um, half the year or so. And gray water systems, I um, just installed one of these in my home this past year. So now the water from our bathrooms and um, I mean, when I, from our bathtubs, from our showers, from our faucets, from our washing machine, they go out to our yard where they water trees as opposed to going to our septic tank. So it's nice because that way we can use less water um, from our, directly from our well. We are reusing water. And on farms for agriculture, you can use high efficiency irrigation techniques like drip line irrigation. And you can use reclaimed water from wastewater treatment plants like we saw at El Estero with the purple, um, you know, the purple pipes. You can line your irrigation canals to prevent leaks, uh, level fields to reduce runoff, choose crops appropriate to the climate, and eliminate government subsidies of inappropriate crops and methods. What that means is don't let the government give you money to grow crops that aren't really, that are expensive to grow, basically. And maybe new GM crops that use less water 
or required less water. We can also use less in our plants and factories in the in industry. So we can shift to processes that save water and thus money. What I mean by that is looking to see if there's any way in your process that you can um, be more efficient with water. One example that comes to my mind is um, not exactly a plant or a factory, but local um, car washing gas stations. They recycle that water as they're washing the cars. So um, that's pretty cool. You can also repair any pipe leaks and use gray water also. So economically, um, just a real quick kind of the general idea here is um, can you allow water to be used more efficiently if the water is privately owned as opposed to the government who might be using tax money to subsidize inefficient irrigation practices? What that means is making the water really cheap for farmers so that they end up not feeling pressure to use less of it. Um, yeah, so that's the main idea there. And um, the desalination, this is a third solution, which is the removal of salt from seawater to create fresh water. And it's done by reverse osmosis, where you're filtering the water by forcing it through an expensive membrane with tiny pores. Many of you probably have reverse osmosis in your home for your kitchen faucet. You can also do distillation, which is the boiling of water and condensing the pure steam back to water. And both of those can get rid of any impurities, but they require a lot of energy. Um, however, perfecting this technique would, or technology would mean the oceans could provide us with unlimited fresh water. Uh, most of the world's 7,500 desalination plants are in wealthy oil states of the Middle East where water is scarce because it's desert um, and, um, and there's plenty of money for electricity, money that came from oil in their ground. All right, Santa Barbara actually had a desalination plant that was built in the 90s. They spent $34 million on it and ran for two weeks and then they shut it down because it was not worth the expensive operation. And you can see, you might notice it, it's right across the street from where El Estero Wastewater Treatment Plant is. All right, so um, in this, uh, we're going to pause here, and in the next part, we'll take a look at controlling water.